to pray for uh, Pastor Ken Grace. It's his granddaughter, Scout. What's her name? Yeah, it's granddaughter. She's in ICU. His grandmother, <laughs> granddaughter, is in ICU. So let's pray for her. Lord, we pray right now for, for Ken, Lord God. And Lord, we know how it is to be a grandparent father, to have your grandchildren sick, Lord. And Lord, I do pray that uh, the Holy Spirit would be with him there, Lord God. And Lord, give him peace, his wife, Lord. And Lord, we pray that somehow, Lord God, you would just reach down, Lord God, and touch her. And Lord, whoever else is sick here, Father, we pray for them too, Lord Jesus, and their families. Now, Lord, give us wisdom at this moment, Lord God, uh, that you would speak through us, Lord God. And we thank you so much again for the people that are here. In Jesus' name we pray, God. Amen. Read the list. Yeah. I am the uh, sacrificial lamb here. They uh, handed me this sheet of questions that it says uh, the following questions were submitted uh, from some of the pastors that registered for the conference. So I don't know if that's true or they just wrote these down or, uh, but uh, I, will, I will ask the questions and aim them at certain individuals to get even. Hi, Damien. <laughs> um, the first question here is, what is the CCA Council? By the way, it seems like a lot of these questions are kind of, some of them are a little redundant, so I might have to make up questions by the end here. Uh, what is the CCA Council? How was it established? And how does it work? Done. Yes. Yes. It's done. <laughs> CCA Council is was CCOF uh, first. Actually, CCOF started uh, many years ago. Odin Fong, uh, kind of when Calvary's first started coming along, Odin kind of headed up a little database, and as people came in, and then as uh, churches were added, then there was questions in a way of evaluating if they didn't come directly out of a Calvary that there's familiarity with, and it kind of grew over the years. In the year 2002, when John Corson and I came back to Calvary in Costa Mesa, uh, Chuck asked me if I would restructure CCOF, and uh, and what, how I thought it ought to, what, you know, when we talked back and forth on it, I was very strong. I thought it should be regionalized. That is that he should begin to look at different, you know, of his sons around the country, around the world that he felt that had gone out that represented him well, and that they should be the one. If, if Joe Fost planted a church, Joe should be the one to evaluate if they're a Calvary. If they were the one, he should oversee it. He should affiliate it. And it should happen there, not at a, a file cabinet in Costa Mesa and, a process, and processed there. He agreed with that. And uh, we actually let it sit for three months because I wanted to make sure he really had a piece about it because it was meaning giving away, uh, you know, an authority that had already been always been based strongly at Costa Mesa. And then after three months, he agreed, and then we we put it together, and that was the first kind of operational aspect of uh, the regionalization of a CCOF. Then uh, John and I, as Chuck ended up, we, we Chuck was going to retire. He didn't got all excited and re-energized and felt he wanted to stay. And John and I said, great, God bless you. We're going to go do other things. After some you know, processes of events where I kind of went to Laguna a little bit, then Chuck asked me if I would like to, because Gene also had been very involved in women's ministry, and he and Kay couldn't travel any longer if we would kind of work with the movement. And, uh, and we did that, and, and we loved that, and did that for some time. Then as it came down with Chuck and his cancer, began to develop in his age, you know, getting to him, there was the mounting questions, Chuck, what is your plan? What is your plan? And he always just kind of left it for quite a period of time. Well, the Lord will, you know, work it out. Then actually back in Philadelphia, we were back there to question and answer time. And Chuck made a statement there. He says, well, I'm going to gather together some of my, you know, first generation, you know, men and, and, uh, and 
there had been other conversations that kind of led to that, the reforming it back, you know, bringing it back to that. And uh, I had had a couple conversations with Chuck that I was, he was kind of indicating or telegraphing to me that he wanted me to be involved in it. And I'll be very honest, I didn't want to do it. And uh, in fact, we were coming back from a conference and I told him, I, we were actually had the pastor's conference out in uh, Murrieta, and I backed out of the conference. It was going through 1 Corinthians. And it's the only conference in my history I've ever canceled out of. But I just didn't feel, I, I felt Chuck was about to do something, and I did, I had, when I did CCOF before, I was the most difficult time because it was, I was a political thing. All my life before, I'd been ministry, just teaching and helping planting churches, and people liked me. I liked them. It was nice. <laughs> and then when I did CCOF, every time a decision came back to you, you made a new enemy and uh, with everything. And I, and I was actually, I didn't like it. I, it was a difficult time, and I felt he was wanting to do that again. And I was, Gene and I were very happy. I backed out of that thing. Well, while out of the conference, and I, I could, I sense he was going to do something. He was close to it. He had made mention of it at different events, and I just told him. I and he said, "Why don't you want to go?" I said, "Chuck, it's just, I'm happy, you know." And uh, he didn't make sense to him. Well, we're, the conference happened. I guess most of you were probably there. I wasn't, but there was kind of a discussion there with Chuck. What are your plans? And uh, Greg, I know that I saw a video later of Greg and Brian and Bob Coy and Ricky Ryan and Chuck that was showed to me. But uh, during that conference, I get a call from Terry Reynolds, who's here somewhere, I think. And, uh, and Terry calls me and he says, Chuck wants you to come out to the conference. And uh, I, said, I said, Terry, I'm not coming. Why does he want me to come? He wants to redo. The CCUF again. He wants you to do it. I said, Terry, I'm not going to come. I'm sorry. It's just not me. He calls me back and he says, Chuck wants you to come and talk about it. And I said, Terry, I'll tell you what. If Chuck wants to, if he wants to come over to my house for lunch on Saturday, I'll t you will talk. I just don't feel comfortable about it here. And so he calls me back and he said he'll be there for lunch on Saturday. <laughs> Joe was there, Terry was there, Greg Laurie was there, and Chuck. We had lunch and sat and you had some sandwiches and things, and then finally, okay, Chuck, what's on your mind? He said, I want to do, I want to redo CCOF. I want to call the guys back together. I want to turn it over to them. And uh, I sat there, and Joe will remember it very well. I was just, I, because I, I looked at him and I said, Chuck, I need to know something. Is this the cancer, or is this the Holy Spirit? And he stared back at me for a moment. He says, it's the Holy Spirit. I said, OK, what do you want to do? And we got out a, pen, a piece of paper and a pen, and we had names. And I said, who do you want? Nobody suggested any names. Chuck I said, who do you want? There was Rawl, there was myself, Sandy. Well, everybody that's up here. There was uh, uh, Wayne Taylor. There was uh, Bob Coy, Greg Laurie. Uh, Malcolm. Malcolm Wild. Bill Stonebreaker. Bill Stonebreaker. Jack Hibbs. Jack Hibbs. And that was the, and Brian Broder, so that was the list. Brian wasn't there for the lunch, but that was the list. So, okay, we'll, we'll do that. A couple of days later, I met with Chuck and Brian, and Brian said that he had said that he wanted to add some more names to it. At which time, and I just sat there, I didn't, but I'm, I didn't add, subtract, I didn't do anything. He wanted to add Ricky Ryan, Bob Caldwell, Tom Stipe, Ray Bentley, Ray Bentley Lloyd. Lloyd Pulley. And, uh, and so that was the restructuring of, uh, and Skip Heitzig, who Skip Heitzig was on the original yeah. list. And uh, the, so, okay, we'll call them together and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get them and see where everybody's she at. She was on the original list. Too. What? She was she, on the original list. Yeah. Too. yeah, no, didn't I say Damien? No. Oh, Damien was on the original, yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Guzik. And Guzik was on the original, yeah. <laughs> 
I don't. I'm, I don't. I've got part timers, okay? <laughs> Selective or something. I, I don't know. But anyway, so we'd have to. You would. Terry, I, Terry would know the list. I can't. He was there for the first one anyway. And so anyway, that's that's what happened. Well, t to be very open and honest, I think that when we started meeting right from the very first, there was kind of a uh, as a schism. I don't know what it, what it was. It, we're going to work together. We're going to do whatever we got to do. And uh, you know that, but. Uh, and a seemingly a willingness, we've got to lead this movement. It's turned over to us as a group. And, uh, uh, but then it was, it was soon, you know, where there seemed to be uh, some that wanted to go a different way. And, and the question in terms of, uh, then when CCA, Chuck basically changed the name of CCOF to CCA. You weren't grandfathered into CCA. You know, the name was just changed. It wasn't like you, were, you went from one database to another. It was just a change of the database, a change of the name of it, you know, from CCOF to give it a fresh name or image or whatever, and a leadership where now, rather than being done by Costa Mesa, it was overseen by the council. Uh, there at that time. My agreement with Chuck at that time because of what both Chuck and I had been through in the political aspect when decisions would be made regionally and then they would go appeal to either me or Chuck and it was the, the it was political you didn't like it and I asked Chuck I said Chuck one thing I do ask of this and that is that neither you or I will have a voice in it that you will really truly release it to the regions what decision they make, it can only be ruled, overruled by the entire council so that we're not in the political loop of it. I, I just don't have the stomach for that. I don't want to do that and uh, that one person shouldn't have that. Later on, that was misinterpreted by other emails that kind of came out saying, well, Chuck has been thrown off of his own, you know, leadership and uh, thing of which it, it, let me tell you, if Chuck Smith, if anyone ever would have sat there and said, I want something, He'd have got it. We all know Chuck, you know, but it, at the same time, it was something he said, I agree with that. And so he would tell people, well, hey, don't ask me. I don't have any power anymore. <laughs> but he actually said he liked that. I was, he, he was glad to be free from that and turning it over. So anyway, then with time, people say, well, what has happened to the council going from the original number? And that is essentially there that whether you want to call it a split or whatever you want to call it is there has been a parting of ways. Like Brian in his letter that he wrote, how can two walk together lest they be in agreement? There was, you know, where Brian felt this desire, I want to go, I want to, you know, you know, and there was different things that he wanted to explore and you know, levels of maybe, you know, service of women in the ministry and various things. And I don't know all of them. You could get that list elsewhere from, than from me. But it was something that within the core of us, there was a very strong commitment to the distinctives. Uh, one of the things, I actually wrote the first distinctives. And uh, when I ran the Bible college back in the 1970s, I think there were six of them. Later on, Larry Taylor rewrote it, added a few, and then Chuck did some, Roger Wing did a re we went through four or five revisions. But there were things that basically within us, they were our DNA. The, those distinctives by this generation, I think sitting up here, we would all say, those things aren't just things that we, okay, I'll sign on to join the club. Those are things that we believe that we believe that we believe. They're non-negotiable to us. We believe them as much as maybe when Chuck started saying these are distinctives and we said, okay, you know, but then one day we wake up as the, we reviewed the scriptures ourselves, we are completely sold on them. And, and if somebody else doesn't want them or agree with them or want to work with them, then you're free to go and uh, or whatever like Chuck used to say and I think one of the hard things for us as a group is to become a voice that's been unified and uh, we had a, a, a pastor who for 40 some odd years took all the heat all of it you know whether it was the manifested sons of God the children of God the perfection of the saints you know 
positive confession, Oral Roberts, Vineyards, Gold Dust, Brownsville, you know, the Toronto Blessing. Chuck it took them all straight on Calvinism, and he just said, this is it, this is how it is. You know, if you, if you don't like it, go away. Don't go away mad, but just go away. I mean, he was very, yeah, and he took that, and we just went behind and had that solid, Voice, and I think that we, if if we failed the movement at all, it's been where to come to that where we together have realized we have a responsibility to speak out and to take that stand that Chuck stood for. I knew that day when I'm looking at him and he's looking at me, and I because I did not want to walk through this door. I just I didn't know what it was going to be, but I'd been through it before and I didn't like it, and. Uh, uh, and, and I didn't really want to go through it. I knew there would be heat with it. I knew there would be disagreement. And but yet, uh, it's funny. I'm a Scot. I don't know what you know about the Scots, but they're warriors, I guess, and uh, brave heart and that stuff. You know. I mean it. Uh, <laughs> but I. But the, you know, when they came over to America, there was the Quakers, and uh, they're the Puritans. You know, where the Puritans and, and a lot of the the came over there were either. Quakers, they were Scottish covenants. They didn't get along with each other. The Puritans were Quakers, and we're non-fighters. We, we don't like being persecuted. We want to be what we want. We want freedom of worship, but we don't fight. And the Scots said, we'll fight to our last bone. Uh, 25 of Washington's generals were Scots. And, uh, and I don't know whether it's my blood or something. I don't, I, I, I'm really a Puritan. I'm a Quaker. I, 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 I don't <laughs> like fighting. But I also look and say there's a point where I will fight. These are worth fighting for. These are worth taking a stand. And, uh, and to me, that is, I think what has happened is it's taken us a while as a group, but I believe we're really solidified as one voice and one heart that we just are not, there's nothing new about us. We haven't changed anything that I know of one bit in our agenda. We just simply all said, you know, what, the, what we has, have been laid for us is what we love. And we believe you know, if there's anything Calvary Chapel needs, it's just a fresh outpouring of the Spirit. We don't need to look at, go back and we read, rewrite or find some new ground. We just need a fresh work. And so I don't know if that helps, but... So you wonder where the numbers have gone up and down, and basically the group that Chuck originally actually had is kind of what it's back to. And that happened in, in my den originally. And so people, and, and the ones that want to be with, and I think God bless them. I'm not, we're not saying we're the, just like I think uh, uh, Sandy said in his message, we're not, we're not, right any writer than anybody else it's just who we are it's our tribe I'm not saying we're better than Acts 29 or gospel coalition or somebody else they've got their tribe we've got our tribe this is we're happy with it and would that be fair probably the one radical <laughs> change that we all agreed on in the distinctives is that we probably wouldn't include that you can't stand up or raise your hands during worship. Yes, that's true. <laughs> no, that, that, Chuck changed that at the end. Yeah. You know, he, he really kind of reverted back to, he, Chuck, I, if you ever stood on a platform with Chuck, he not only knew every verse of every song in that songbook by heart, he sang him by, you, I did acapella in his own. I hated to stand next to him because he sang the part, you know, the tenor or something. I just sang like people sing, and he uh, <laughs> and the and I couldn't share it. He loved the hymns. He was just a hymnologist. He could have, but and he kind of reverted back to a lot of things. And uh, I think the vineyard standing and some of that confusion kind of yeah, that brought a lot of confusion. San, Sandy Adams um, brought up a one-liner. We were having a, a gathering in San Diego, and we were going to hold the conference there. And um, there were people that were contentious with all that. And Sandy had just uh, arrived in San Diego, and David was crying, and he was upset that... Uh, <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
And uh, <laughs> Sandy had watched a movie. I don't know if it's R or not, but <laughs> thank you. But he looked at the one person that was the most contentious and said, I saw this just as I was getting off the plane. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go long, far. Huh? Far. You want to go far, then you go together. And we're together, people. We want accountability. We, I can tell you from my point of view, which isn't very much, but I'm sitting with these men because I trust each one of them. I've known them for years, but the wonderful thing is I know their hearts and there's no agenda. There's one thing that we picked up through osmosis with Chuck was that he did not have a plan. He woke up every day and he followed the Holy Spirit. That drove people crazy. Don and I were two of the first intern pastors he hired at 75 bucks a week if we needed it or not. Um, <laughs> he was so fun because he didn't like any of us. We were different than him. And yet he began to love us. And it was a good for us to see him go through his stages of growth. Many people ran because they wanted him to be perfect. But we understood, all of us here, that ultimately he is a man of love. I've seen him with people that was overwhelming, with no agenda. I sat with him and uh, his son and Skip Heitzig in the state house in Beijing, China, being honored by the Chinese government. I have seen him with generals. I have seen him with all sorts of people at the highest level of the world and nobody even knows it. He had no agenda. Whatever the Lord brought in front of him. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in his house, or excuse me, his office. It drove me crazy. And I was able to spend some time with him before he died. And I said, Chuck, I have this question. For years, I've been in your office with really heavy burdens. And when I worked for you, things that I could make the decision on, but I wanted your input. And the phone would ring on your line, and you'd pick it up and start talking to somebody. And then I'd be sitting there for 30 minutes waiting to put my heart on the table and let him do some work on it. And I said, so why do you do that? Why did you do that? I wanted me to be able to understand everything about you so that when you're in heaven, I'm able to do my best. And he said, well, I figure the Holy Spirit knows we're in a counseling meeting. And if he wants to interrupt it, he'll have somebody call me. <laughs> and this person will have a bigger problem than the person that's sitting in front of him. Now, if you come counsel with me, I'd never let anything interrupt it. But that was Chuck's way. And we all loved him. We did not have an ax to grind. We've all been thumped by him. He's a hard taskmaster. But he's the most loving person you'd ever meet. Next question, how are regions going to be established under the new leadership? I want to go back a step and address the uh, first question. I, and I guess I just want to make a statement. Um, Brian Broderson is a friend of mine. I consider him a brother. Um, I pray for him. I love him. Uh, but I felt like, I do feel like that some separation had to occur. I also respect his many years of faithful service to, to our Lord. But I feel like some separation ultimately had to occur. Uh, he had some different ideas of how the movement needed to be led and the direction that the movement needed to go. Uh, it's not for me to define those ideas. He, he, can, he can do that himself. But he had some definite uh, different kinds of ideas for, for moving us forward. We had a, 
um, a stay the course kind of mentality. We felt like the first thing that needed to be said to our, to our movement after our founders passing was that, hey, the same Calvary Chapel we received is the same Calvary Chapel we're going to pass on to the next generation. It doesn't need to be changed. It doesn't need to be tinkered. We just need to live out the principles that Chuck put into our heart. And so um, uh, uh, apparently uh, Brian felt like some changes needed to be made. So he's gone a different direction than we have. There's, there's been a, a separation. Uh, but I think that's a good thing. He needs the freedom. He needs the room to do those things that God has put on his heart. We need to be able to follow our conscience and hold fast to the things that God has put in our heart. And you know what's going to happen? God is going to bless whom he chooses. He can now bless either or he can bless both. And, and I think that that's where we're at. And, um, you know, I, uh, we, we don't view anybody here as the enemy. I don't. I couldn't uh, agree more with that. I want to make, make that clear. I, I'm, I'm happy that, that there, there is the room within our movement to, uh, to branch out, to, to do whatever God puts on his heart. And, um, but we just want to stay the course. And we want to make sure that the affiliation process, that's what's important to, to, to me. We want to, our, our movement has, it, it's unprecedented how many Calvary chapels have been added to our movement. And at the same time, they all maintain the same distinctives and the same flavor. That's unprecedented. And I think uh, that's the Holy Spirit's work among us. But I think that's also uh, the fact that we have an, a, a relational-based affiliation process that uh, has, con has perpetuated the Calvary chapels as they have. And, and as long as that's respected, as long as there's one group that's setting that stage and, and uh, setting that agenda, and that's the CCA Council, then I think we're moving in a, in a good direction. And there's freedom from indiv for individual Calvary Chapel pastors to, to do as the Lord might lead them. That's just what I wanted to add. If anybody disagrees with that, um, we'll go out back. But <laughs> Raul, See Raul, Raul disagrees. Uh, he disagrees. Except Raul. <laughs> Except Raul. Raul. Raul kill you afterwards, man. <laughs> Choke him out. <laughs> no, you, know, I, you know, I think one of the difficult things for all of us is we're Christian men, so we know that Jesus values unity we know that we're to love one another. Uh, we know that, that we're as much in need of God's grace as anybody. So, so the hard thing is, you know, you've been in this movement for 40 years. You, you, you live and die with it. The guys here on stage to me are the kind of guys you, you live and die for. And uh, to see, you know, the, the separation in the beginning left us all kind of scratching our heads where you want to be able to say to the Lord at the end of the day, Lord, the church is yours. This is your bride. It's not mine. I have no entitlement here. Make us wise to do this so that however it rolls out here, it honors you because there's no option in regards to loving one another or, or understanding what the unity of the faith is. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, have, having strong convictions about what I've invested my life, I think we all feel the same, and, and how we want to move forward, and the, the, the men that we have been given the privilege to minister to in our, in our own ministries, and the churches born out of our churches, so we, we want to be that, that influence there too. So that, make, that you know, it made it difficult, we, because, because we want to do what's right. And then what swirled around it was social media and all yeah. the stuff that just was like, come on, you know, just, and have we made mistakes? Absolutely. But let me just say, our pastor has asked us to lead uh, our movement in a way that we don't even lead our own churches. You know, we're all strong leaders. We're all uh, pastor-driven churches. But now we've been asked to come together in a collaborative way and make uh, corporate decisions. And there's safety in that. There's safety for you. There's safety for our movement in that. We, we come to a consensus about things before we, before we move forward. That, that can become uh, burdensome and cumbersome for people that aren't used to, to leading in that manner. And, and maybe that's why other people have, have decided this is too cumbersome. 
Uh, but for me, this is safe. And I think Pastor Chuck showed great wisdom in establishing it this way because it's not uh, Joe's interpretation of Calvary Chapel that, that rules the day or Don's or Raw's or mine. It's, it's our collaborative understanding of what God has called us to do uh, that, that's going to dictate how we move forward. And, and that doesn't always translate into efficient leadership, but I think in the long run that will translate more into trusted and faithful leadership. So, yeah, I like to say something because um, with Pastor Chuck Smith for me, uh, Chuck and uh, Raul were very, very close. Um, the wonderful thing that I love about Raul is he's so transparent and he's not a tough guy, he's a pussycat. <laughs> he's wasted a lot of man money on those lessons that he... <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I like to say that when I met uh, Chuck Smith, like these guys too, he gave me an opportunity. Uh, I never had opportunities, you know, I was on my own way, and uh, when, I, um, when I got saved, my mother-in-law was trying to take me to Calvary Chapel for two years, and I wouldn't go. And so God had to break me in order for my wife and I to go to Calvary Chapel, and, and to see a loving person, but most important, I saw the teaching of God's Word. Every church that I tried to go to, they were always trying to rip us off. And Chuck was very transparent, very, I mean, just, he would tell you the truth, you could trust him, but you can't trust a lot of people. And I never wanted to be a part of a denomination. I thank God the way Chuck taught all of us here. Because he taught us, he taught me how to love. Because all, all my life, I hate people. And uh, he taught me. Uh, these guys taught me I love. And they've been like, really great friends in my life. They've been really, uh, I helped me to me that I would never give up these guys because they're real friends. As a Marine, you know, Vietnam, we learned that we don't leave our dead, and we don't leave our wounded. And these guys have been like that. You know, they've picked me up, and we picked up each other. And uh, we don't want to do anything against anybody. We just want to see the Holy Spirit move. We want to see people get saved. We want God to use you guys the way he used us and continues to use each one of us individually. And just like Don said, you know, if you don't want to be part of it, that's cool. That's, that's fine. We're not a denomination. But I'll tell you, that's all I knew. It's Jesus Christ crucified and what I was taught by my pastor. To love people, to forgive people, which I have hard times many times, especially when they betray Chuck Smith which was like a dad to me. I'm just honest with you guys. You know, and I just really feel my wife has to pray for me all the time because I feel like, you know, why would these guys, why would they want to hurt any one of these guys? When they don't, when they don't know their hearts. I'm Damien, I'm Damien, Joe, all of us. We've never put down anybody. We really haven't. We pray for you guys. We love you guys. And you have to make up your own mind to listen to the Holy Spirit where he wants you to be. And where he wants you to be, he'll bring forth fruit. And I think that's my, that's my heart that I would never trade. All I know is Calvary Chapel. And it's not about Calvary Chapel. It's the teaching that I had in my life. The teaching of the Word of God. I don't know anything else. So that's just my thoughts to you guys. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't become a Calvary Chapel just to be a Calvary Chapel. What I did is, is I, I wanted a pastor, you know? And when I saw Pastor Chuck Smith, I saw him as, as a model. I saw him as somebody I could say, and I still do at my age, that one day 
I want to be like that. One day, I want to grow up to be like him. You know, that was my dad, but that was my spiritual father. You know, and so when I became a Calvary minister, it was, you know, if Chuck would have said one day, I'm going to call myself and just call himself by another name. The name of the organization never mattered. What mattered was my relationship with Chuck Smith, Pastor Chuck. And when I got saved, like these fellas here, in, in a time, it, it was called the Jesus Movement. It wasn't called Calvary Chapel Movement. It was the Jesus Movement. And so we have hearts that are united in essentials that have, over the years, like Don was saying, have basically evolved, if you will, to a way to say distinctively, this is kind of our heart. So we've never tried to force people, you have to do this and you have to say this and believe this and sign this. No, it's always been deep calling unto deep. You know, the relationships that many of us have up here have taken years to develop. We've gone through our ups, we've gone through our downs. I've, I've asked advice from probably most everybody up here, you know, help me, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and like many of you, I would come to the first conferences I ever did, and I'd look out there, and I'd, and I'd say, these are men, uh, these are men I want to be like. These are men that I want to grow up to be like, except for all. But the other ones, <laughs> but the other ones. He's going to kill you, man. He's going to kill me. He's going to kill you. <laughs> I'm going to kill you. With no, one no, little no, finger. No, 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 no. Put those on. I'd like to see you know, those. you know, those are Rawls glasses. Those are just reading glasses. <laughs> he got those from Joseph Smith. <laughs> That's just how I picture them. <laughs> okay, let me ask a question. Okay. <laughs> Have you guys been blessed by this conference? We believe, I believe, I'm not speaking for all the fellows, but I think they'd agree. I believe this is what the conferences are supposed to be, where we love each other, we tease each other, we enjoy each other, we're family in Christ. And, and, and it's not because we're called Calvary Chapel, it's because we're believers and we love Jesus together. And that's what Chuck taught us to do. And that's why this feels so real. It's because these men up here, we love each other. And that's, isn't that the mark of a Christian? Isn't that what Jesus said? By this, all men shall know you are my disciples. Not if you're called Calvary Chapel, but if you love one another. And we have been blessed. And I want to give honor right now to Pastor Chuck. I think it's been a long time coming from, you know, in my ears. I haven't heard this for a while. But I want to say, we all say this. Thank God for Chuck Smith, for his ministry in our life. He was our pastor. What's the question? Wake up, Damien. Damien. <laughs> Just your thoughts. No, yes, no. <laughs> Damien, why don't you tell us how you came to the Lord and how Chuck would influence your life? Yeah, wow. <sighs> I probably, um, you know, I come from the ranks of a pretty big part of Calvary Chapel that we got to know Pastor Chuck by the tapes. And, you know, I met with him a few times through the years in the different meetings mainly. I never called him. 
Um, I wasn't opposed to doing that. I always felt like he was so busy. Why would I call him? I should have called him several times, but wasn't smart enough to use him as a resource. But I developed a relationship with him through just the power of the teaching of the word. And I watched him like a hawk, how he, he handled himself. The three most influential men in my life in terms of as a Christian man and as a pastor, Chuck Smith, uh, Gail Irwin, and a man named Bill McDonald. And all three of them, just a tremendous example for a guy that would be in a I had lost everything I considered to be valuable in life a hundred times by now. That's stupid. And the fact that these guys lived and Chuck among them and let me see something different and learn by watching. So I could just, I can never put it into words, but even from that distance of, of through the, the media, you know, he saved my life. God did it through him. Yeah. You guys can see how we feel about Chuck. Uh, there's no question in our mind, there's no question in my mind that, that these guys are really men of God and that you guys are men of God. You guys have, you have to have discernment. You have to make choices in life. But the greatest choices are eternity. How are you going to finish? Jack always used to say, how are you going to finish? And we've seen a lot of guys that haven't finished well. And the reason is because they got their eyes of Jesus. They got out of teaching and reading and praying, all these things. And it went to their heads. And I think when you get proudful, God has his ways of taking you down. And God wants us to be simple, humble. I know all these guys here, you know, we're not looking for any uh, recognition. We don't re I don't really care. All I care is that the church, the church would be recognized as a loving church, as a teaching church, and that people would see that example in all of our lives here, you guys. If one guy gets a black guy, we all get a black guy. You know, and we have to work as a family. And we have to come to that place. The time is short. How are we going to finish? And then it hurts deep and down. I know what Nathan goes through too. I, you know what, Jamie, uh, I'm all messed up here. That uh, Damien knows because Damien also, he suffers. You know, he's been sick too. I think most of us here, you know, I, I suffer from, from my little seizures. I have one today. And, you know, it, it's embarrassing. When you're teaching all these people, you're on the radio life, and all of a sudden you have a seizure. I don't pass out. I can't think. I can't read. I can't speak. I don't pass out. I see everybody. And it's so humiliating. So humiliating that um, when I went to Vietnam to do that film, Taking the Hill, it really affected me. I lost 41 of my friends. And I told these guys, there's no possible way that I could leave any one of these guys or any one of you. And that's real love. That's real caring. That's not, you know, bonding out to men, but I think it's a, it's a situation where you come to that place where you live with these guys, thank you, where you live with these guys, and you know these guys would die for you. And uh, when I back to Vietnam, I was never the same. I had to go to those places where I had to carry those guys. And it, it was hard. And it hurts me to see that the church can get along. 
You know, when I went to Chuck, I got saved. I saw these guys' testimonies, and it's not about giving our testimony. That has nothing to do with it. It's your life. How do you live your life? Your congregation watches you. People watch you. And how many black guys we've seen, us here, people that they were looked up to, and yet they had another agenda. It went to their heads instead of having Jesus in their hearts and watching what Jesus was going to do in their lives. So that's, that's my heart with you guys. I would say this too. There's a, there's a wonderful sense of accountability. I mean, I see Jeff over there. There's just, there's a, you know, the group is bigger. There's, but I, I know, you know, Sharon and Ryan, and I, I, your kids and Don, your sons and Gene and Zach. And your, you know, I, I know your Maria and your families, your kids. And what your creates kids accountability is genuine you. love. It isn't, okay, accountability is this biblical principle. It is. But accountability is real when there's this kind of vulnerability and there's love. Because I can see it on somebody's face when they're miserable. There's like, how you doing, Joe? Great. Oh, sure. What's going on with you? You know, just it's a wonderful thing. I'd encourage you guys to, you know, to, to make sure as the years go on, you have men that you're growing closer together with, that you let the Holy Spirit knit you together with guys that are like-minded, like-hearted, their wives, their kids. It's so important to their kids to see that too. So there's, there's a wonderful thing that goes on here with this. That's why it was hard, it, it was hard some of our reaction. Th th these are guys that would take a bullet for me, that I would take a bullet for. This is, that I would take a bullet for their wives, for their kids, for their, you know, so there, there's this wonderful koinonia and love given to us by the Spirit, but it creates a great accountability too where we we, we, you know, moving forward, we, we have wanted that to stay in place and unfractured, you know. One of the things that I think has taken a little bit of time is that we've been together, you know, for 30 to 40 years, all of us up here, and uh, 46 or something, but the, uh, but we've been to like brothers family, friends, and I mean many, many, many aspects has come together with all of our kids and and it's it's been a wonderful thing, but it was always something when we were together, we'd meet and plan conferences and we'd be together for a few days. We had a lot of kidding and laughing and fun and like, you know, family, you know, and uh, then we, you know, Chuck would be there and join in with all of it and then we'd maybe, then there was a point where Chuck would kind of clear his throat and uh, okay, now let's get down to business. And we always had, it's in a sense, like a father figure. And uh, somebody there, he had that strength. He cast a huge shadow. He had a tremendous presence. I don't think we could underst understate that when you look at a movement that has been produced of the magnitude of what Calvary Chapel is. It's a tremendous statement and legacy as time goes on to look at this thing. And, uh, and, we, and, and we had the benefit of just traveling in his wake. You know, he was like this ship that went through the huge waves, but the ship, the, the ones behind us, we just jumped around in our little dinghies and had fun and, you know, and hey, this is great. Well, he's, he's cutting the path through some rugged waters for us all the time. He, he saved the movement, spoke strongly, you know, when, when it, it, shepherding came along and a bunch got involved in it and could have destroyed the movement positive confession manifested sons of god vineyard. all of these vineyard all of these things and chuck took the heat and people came and didn't understand him or didn't agree and he took a, in the meantime we're in our little dinghies back there saying okay that's hey this is cool and we're going on and then one day the ship's gone and now he says it's yours and it's taken us i think a little time to realize collectively to join together to that's a new role for us and it's been, uh, I, I, I'm sorry in one sense that in our time of just becoming one, in our kind of struggles at this new identity, in terms of our love for each other, our families, our commitment, our values, the, the, the distinctives, that's non-negotiable. Those are subtle. It's just having now to, to come together, how do we speak with one voice? Because one of the things I knew when I sat across the room from Chuck that day, 
and and he was asking me for days i knew he was going to ask it i knew that was what he was coming to lunch for but i also knew there was no way i would ever could ever be that voice ever it would only happen if collectively it, any single one of us never could have done it never could have done it and uh it would only happen in whatever time it's taken for us to come together and collectively to say we are one we know who we are we know what we stand for and and now to begin to say as chuck would say if it, if it isn't you god bless you chuck was very gracious you know and say if you want to go go if, and, and the door's open to come back uh, I, I ordained John Wimber. He spent a year with me in Lake Arrowhead. And my brother, John McClure, Vineyards, went Vineyard, broke my heart, tore me to shreds, hard to lowest point of things. And I felt terrible. Chuck came to me knowing how I felt because 40 some odd churches went with, with them. And that was a huge number at the time. I was broken hearted, although Chuck agreed to ordain him and let him go. <laughs> we, we argued over that a lot, but he did. But anyway, uh, it came down that Chuck came to me and he says, Don, this is good. I'm fine with this. I said, Chuck, how can you be? I feel terrible. And he said, Don, it's John 15. Once in a while, there's a pruning. Some, there's a, people want a door out. They're not happy. They want something different. They're looking for it. And you need to have a door where they can go out. And you want to leave it open if they want to come back. And, that, and some did and some didn't. But I think collectively what has happened is, is that we have really truly become deeper and deeper. We listen to one another. We respect one another. There is no leader amongst us. There really isn't. We sit around, you know, and we've had meetings sitting here. And Sandy said, well, I think this. <laughs> Sandy God bless you. you so Sandy's taking care of it, not me. And then Sandy's maybe passing it to Joe. I don't know. But, but it's, it's a wonderful thing being a team where we really mutually say the Lord's will is going to be done collectively and uh, not by one single one voice. And we're learning that. But we're committed to that, that one heart. Mm -hmm. We're not airing dirty laundry but I think this is important, what Don just shared. We went to Colorado. Somebody offered us their home to stay in, and Chuck had handpicked some guys to just go and be with. I sat next to him with his uh, nurse, and uh, he was on oxygen. And I really felt he was going to die in the airplane. And he looked so uh, beaten uh, physically in his countenance. And you never saw that countenance darkened. Well, after we were singing the next day uh, at breakfast, uh, uh, he started reviving. And then he revived, actually, by the time we came back to California. So uh, we didn't know that there were people other than the original people that Chuck had said, I, I trust you, you men, no one voice, uh, everybody only has one vote, uh, no direct leader. Um, we're not here to control. We're not here to tell you what to do. Sandy made it really clear. If you like Chuck's ministry and what came with it, we're here to just carry that on. We're not Chuckites, um, but we have respect. And so we had uh, planned a conference uh, the first year after he died. And there were certain people that came up that we knew were not really just walking straightly with the Lord. And uh, in that meeting, we all agreed. We love these men, but some of them have problems, and it's being worked through, apparently. So. When we showed up that first meeting, we didn't know who all these other men were. And that surprised us. And then the second thing was, when we all arrived at the conference, not one time was Pastor Check ever recognized or thanked, let alone a time to bow all of our hearts and pray for his widow and his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. That was very difficult. 
It's hard to get me angry, but I became angry. We respect Chuck Smith. And we're thankful to God, as Sandy said, thank God. And Ralph, uh, you said it too, David. Because this man, we're not idolizing him. We were all so foreign to his mindset, but yet he knew God was working. And he stood back for the 47 years or whatever I was with him, um, and he let us be ourselves. He never told us what to do, how to do it, where to do it, and when to do it. And those were the four questions all of us had for him. He forced you to go to the Lord that you got as much enjoyment being on his staff cleaning the toilets out as you did standing in the pulpit and filling in for him. That sounds kind of silly. However, he saw life as one with Jesus. There was no hierarchy in his mind. There were not certain things you have to do. You just be yourself and fall in love with Jesus and he'll do it. And that's the great thing that all of us sit here with right now. We know God has given us gifts. And we know we love people. And we know for this sick world, it is the only answer. Prayer, the Bible, and love. And uh, that's all we stand for. Other people didn't want that or be satisfied with that. So all of us realize we don't want to have a war. We don't want to be the Hatfields and McCoys. We don't want to be in the North and th South. We just let you figure out what you want to do. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. But like Isaiah said, can a leopard actually change his spots? My people have. And we all have the word loyalty and um, uh, trustworthy and faithful in our heart and vocabulary from the Lord. We're not here asking anyone for anything. We just called the clan together and said, whoever wants to have fun and see the Lord and have new friendships, come. And that's all it is. There is no organization. There are no men, women, dogs, or cats over you. None. We're here because we love you and we have vision for what's going on. And we want to help protect you and your families and your congregations. And it's that simple. This guy, we wanted to respect. And in three years, he's never been respected or even mentioned at the uh, conferences. And that's why we're mentioning him right now. Because we know many of you were sad about that. And you didn't understand. Every man can go his own way. Doesn't mean he's going the right way, but he has a right with his life to go his own way. We're here simply to help you. Would you say, Damien? I'd say so. We're here to help. So. There's so many things you could say about Chuck, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I. I never went to anything that he oversaw or led that I ever felt anything was being done to me. It was always being done for me. And, um, you know, sometimes you, some people can look and say, well, these guys are just a bunch of guys, a guy like me, you know, who needed a father figure and so forth. And I certainly, I wasn't looking for one. But I needed one spiritually, uh, desperately. But he never asked me or anyone I knew to compromise. It was, he, he, we have this deep respect for him, but he, he, uh, the Lord used him in our lives in a way that he built his own accountability. He could not have made any of us compromise to follow him anywhere. He never asked for that, but it's a lot more complicated than people see. It's a lot deeper, it's a lot stronger. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not just I was looking for a dad. 
It was, it, it's big in a lot of ways, but he never used it. He never used anything, you know, for um, his own gain and, and uh, never asked to compromise. I repeat myself, but never asked to compromise, never did that. But um, he, he built all of us in such a way that we, we wouldn't. It was about God. It was about his word. And, and that was, um, that built a, maybe an unneeded accountability in his own life, but it was there. It, it's just, a, you know, sometimes it's a funny thing where you get, um, that, I mean, you can go to any bookstore and buy any number of books about whoever is uh, complaining about their parents currently. And, you know, the single focus is so often on, you know, what I didn't get and I felt I needed and maybe did need, you know. And I mean, all that's legitimate. I'm not sweeping that away. Humanity is broad, it's diverse, our needs are great, but we can do that to anybody. But when you stop and you think about what we've been given, what was there, the blessings of the heritage, the blessings of the relationship. We can destroy every relationship in our life if we want to just look at the one or two or three things that we might have maybe done different, but they're not who we are. But then you look at the blessings on the other side of the scale that are just immense. And I pinch myself to have known him and to be a part of this movement with you. I can't believe I get a place somewhere. And so, so much to be thankful for. Well, I noticed that when the people have clapped, Don, the majority has come right through here, the clapping. And these are the volunteers from Ralph's church when he spoke and got a little... You can't see it from here, but it says applaud. It keeps coming up over there. <laughs> you know, Chuck was not a father figure to me. I, I have a great dad. I love him dearly. But I look at my ministry today, 36 years, I've been a Calvary Chapel pastor. We started our church when I was 22 and my wife was 20. And, and I believe that I would, if I, had not, if I had not found Calvary Chapel, I believe that I, I would still be a minister, I'd be a pastor somewhere, I'd, I'd be doing something. But oh, how my ministry looks so much different today because of Chuck Smith and because of Calvary Chapel. And that is what I'm so grateful for. He taught me God's grace. He's the first person I met who wasn't afraid of the Holy Spirit. He gave us a place where we could grow and minister, had the freedom to be led by the Holy Spirit. And yet at the same time, too, we're a part of something bigger than ourselves where we could have some accountability. Where else do you get that combination? Nowhere else. Trust me. A lot of the people that complain about Calvary Chapel, I, I probe into it and I ask them, and they were people who were brought up in Calvary Chapel. It's all they've ever known. Well, trust me, if you've been on the outside looking in, uh, that would minimize your complaints and maximize your gratitude, let me tell you. Because in all that's going on out there in, in the church world, uh, we've got a great thing going. And, and I, I want to keep our hands off of it. What was begun in the Spirit, let's continue in the Spirit. And let's let the Holy Spirit continue to do His work because we've been blessed with a glorious legacy. We can trace those roots all the way back to the New Testament. It goes far back beyond Chuck. But he's the one who was our interpreter. And we have a, a debt of gratitude uh, to him, no doubt about that. Like Joe says, we're the best dysfunctional family around. <laughs> I think the word family is, is, I see so many people that they, they are in organizations. 
And an organization, you know, is just a, a business. An organism is a family. And uh, uh, our lives are knit together. You know, and with the one shall chase a thousand to a great nation. There's something that's wonderful about being unified, working together, same heart, same philosophy, same, same vision. It collectively makes us much stronger. And you know, we're talking about family, but you may be sitting out there and you may be saying, this doesn't feel like family to me. I don't know anybody. I've only been at Calvary Chapel for a year. I, I don't know anybody. I've, I've gone around here for a day and a half now and I hadn't talked to anybody. Nobody's talked to me. I felt that same way. We had these conferences for years and years and years out in California, and I would always come uh, from Atlanta, I'd travel all the way across the country, you know, and came and didn't know anybody, and, um, and I felt so depressed, and my church wasn't growing like everybody else's church was growing, and I'd come back home, and Kathy would say, why do you go to these conferences? You always come back more depressed than when you left. <laughs> and, and it took time. It, it just took time. And you know what it did? It took me getting out of my little bubble, and it took me making an effort to reach out to some, some other people. If, you know, uh, what's the vitamin uh, for friendship? B1. You know, if you want to if you wanna make a friend, you got it. That's you a Sandyism if I ever heard one. B1. Why if, not B2? If you want to make a friend. Why not B3? It'd be a group. <laughs> B4. Yeah. Be a family. B5. <laughs> B12. <laughs> B who? <laughs> yeah. Then you'd be a mess. <laughs> I'm just saying, find a friend. Find a friend. <laughs> That's all he was trying to say. <laughs> Tough to find one up here. <laughs> don't go to dawn. He who would have friends must himself be friendly. If you're here and you don't have any friends, tough luck. Learn it. Be friendly. <laughs> Turn to somebody and say, I don't have any friends. Will you be my friend? <laughs> and uh, they'll say, I know why. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we wanted to be your friend. We just couldn't understand what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> All that food you eat and black eyed peas and stuff. <laughs> well, a few minutes ago, Mike said uh, we should call the Klan together. <laughs> In my part of the country, you don't want to call the Klan together. <laughs> Next question, Joe. <laughs> it's not a question on here that tops any of this. <laughs> Is that all of them? No, there's, if we, ans we answered a lot of the questions before I asked them, so. Uh, we, we answered, there, there's a question about regional. Um, how will the regional areas work now under regional leadership? We are sitting down and working out as some of the regional issues because some of the regions when they were originally set up, you know, like there's some that are, for example, over five states, literally, and uh, region and, and getting them to be able to meet together uh, effectively. Uh, and sometimes, in some cases, there's over 180 in those five states. And so we're, we're going to do some restructuring as we kind of meet. And here in the, the, this area down here in Southern California, uh, you know, actually, uh, who, you? And David. And uh, Jeff. Jeff. Jack. Mike, you guys are restructuring together. You're going to come up with uh, Southern California. is going to change somewhat to average out and get together how they, they're going to work it out and come back and give it to the council. And so that will be restructured and uh, redone. That's in the process by tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow. There is a question here. As a second generation Calvary Chapel pastor, I wanted to know if the if church history 
gives any examples of a movement of God maintaining the same vision and philosophy of ministry for more than a generation beyond after the founding pastor has gone home to be with the Lord? A good question. You answer. Oh, I asked it. <laughs> I'm B1, you're B2. <laughs> And David is be quiet. <laughs> well, Jesus said the gates of hell won't prevail against the church. He was the founder. Here's the church 2,000 years later. We're here. So uh, the, the church abides. It changes, you know, its skin a little here and there. But... Uh, I think one of the things that Chuck did was he raised up Timothy's. Denominations sometimes can lack that. I think there are strong independent churches that Chuck raised up, and it was in the context of family. So right now things are moving forward. I don't, I don't know what we'll see in another generation. Right now um, I'm very confident with the, the guys that are here and the way the things are going, and, and uh, we want to stay the course. We just want to continue mm -hmm. to do what we've always done. And we go to the conferences all around the country, 98% of the guys want to know, can we just stay on course? Can we just continue to be? And we say, yes, just continue to be what we've always been. We have no desire to change that. It's our heritage. It's our legacy. And we think we have the book of Acts and the epistles of the New Testament to back it up. So it isn't, you know, just a Calvary thing. It's a, it's a New Testament. It's a biblical model and philosophy of ministry. So... Um, it's moving forward just at this point we're continuing it's a good idea continue yes. when um, Raul and I went to school together and we were getting our uh, some degree I forget which one it was the doctorate I think uh, we went to lunch with the vice president of the college and Chuck was on one side, excuse me, Raul was on the right side, I was on the left side. We were down to our last week that we had to come up with our thesis and what we're going to discuss and, you know, to get your degree. We'd done all the hoops for six years, now we're here at the end. So uh, I think he's the vice president, he's the guy in charge of the graduate school, and he, he says, well, fellas, what, what is it you're actually going to do? And we hadn't a clue. And out of his mouth, without a blinking a second, he said, oh, Mike and I are going to make a movie. It's called Venture of Faith. And we're going to just trace the history of uh, Calvary Chapel and Pastor Chuck Smith and how God is working through churches that just simply preach the word. And I look behind the, the dean, and he looks over at me and winks at me. And uh, <laughs> I bought him those glasses that Go are with down me there. On this. Um, he, he winks at me. I said, we're going to do what? So we go through the lunch line, and we sit down with him, and we, well, Raul laid it out, and we made this video. Lots of them have gone around the world, actually. It's, called sim it's simply called um, Venture of Faith. Chuck always saw life as a venture of faith. He did. He, he was an explorer, a pioneer, a Navy SEAL. He, he parachuted out of planes without a parachute. He could do about everything. <laughs> So in that, we actually interviewed many pastors outside of Calvary Chapel. And so Raul was friends with John MacArthur. And even to this day, this many years later, uh, John said, in the overall scheme of things of the church, in church history, Calvary Chapel will simply be a footnote. Strange. Um, and then when Chuck died the very next week, he started slandering Chuck and speaking evil of him. There's no way what you're a part of is going to be a footnote. There's no way. God brought us together when the communists had as much control of the USA from the inside as they do today. And God used the Jesus movement to take a whole generation, the largest generation ever born. They're dying off at... 10,000 a day or something right now. And uh, Chuck's ministry is not a footnote because there's so many of you. That's not a footnote. That's a statement from heaven that something's right here. 
No, it's, it's interesting. I was out to uh, I was at, to lunch with um, Jim Cimbala and um, two years ago or so, and he said, "How's Calvary since Chuck has passed?" You know, and I said, "You know, I think 96 percent of the guys, 97 percent, want to continue right on track with what." I said, "There's a small percentage that are looking in other places now at these other some of these other ministries." Jim Simlis said, why in the world would Calvary guys want to look at some other model? He said, God has used you to change the United States in the last 50 years. He said, there's a thousand Calvaries in the United States. Why would you look somewhere else? It was just interesting to hear his perspective as an outsider. You know, he said, the effect that Calvary's had on the country in the last 50 years, why would you look somewhere else at another model at this point? You know. I think what we need is we don't need anything new. We're just like the church at Ephesus, probably the strongest church in the New Testament and uh, incredible church, the ministry that happened in there, the way conversions happened, people turning away from idolatry in massive numbers, uh, incredible numbers. And they, uh, you know, that Smith's going out of business, the goldsmiths, silversmiths, and I mean, incredible thing. And yet a generation later, you know, and the Lord there in the book of Revelation, he speaks to that church and he, and he goes down the list. He says, you've got, and he just gives them incredible credentials. You know, that speaking to the church at Ephesus, how strong you are in the word and you can't stand those that are wrong. You can pick them out. You discern, you deal with what is, what is uh, uh, her heresy and things and you, you've cleaned it up. You've got, you run a tight ship. You don't get tired. You don't faint. You're, you're ready to go. And he says, I just have one thing against you, your first love. And I think that the, the thing that if I would look at us as a movement and that I think every generation, that is something that has to be cultivated again and again and again. God needs to pour out a spirit of fresh on each generation. One of the things that is hard, I think, about this whole period we've been through in the last few years is, is um, you know, the, the struggle we've been through. But the good part of it is that everybody, it's, it's time sometimes to sit and say, what do I truly believe? What makes me tick? This made me make Chuck tick, and that made me make these bunch of guys tick. This is what works for them. What do I believe? And, and were they just kind of sliding on? And it's good for them to go through a struggle. It's good for them to have questions, and good for them to be shaken up a little bit, and then to come, hopefully, to a, a, a conviction. And, and a conviction leads to a what? I forget. Uh, uh, salvation, or I can't remember the list now, but but, but you know, where we really were, each, were each generation, yeah, that's yeah. arrested, that's it. But where, but it's a good thing in a sense to have everybody just this cruising along, and all of a sudden, sometimes a great shaking up, and to say, Who am I? Why do I believe what I believe? Do I believe this? Is this something that I am willing to stand with like Chuck Smith did, like these other guys did? Is this that, that deeply rooted within me or do I want to go look at something else? And I think the wonderful thing that I'm hearing is because everywhere I go, people are saying, what's happening? What's happening? I said, is anything happening with you? No. Everybody said, no, we're not changing. They said, there's no change. You know, the, you're doing good. You know, what we just heard, right? I don't care what you heard. What did, you know, did, be what you are. And, uh, and then find a fresh, and that's what I'm sensing in our worship times here. We've had wonderful worship times. Last night was wonderful. I just prayed it tonight. And, uh, you know, that the Lord just refreshes and he pours out the Holy Spirit afresh on us. I need that. I long for that in my life. So I don't need a new distinctive and uh or to mess around with them i just need god to make the, the, what's there fresh again we've got to uh <laughs> stay on schedule john randall's on the schedule coming up but would you why don't you close us in prayer don and for all of us just pray that god would bring us back to our first love that we'd have a fresh filling of his spirit lord jesus we we thank you. Lord, we thank you for our heritage. Lord, we want to thank you for Chuck Smith. He's, he wasn't God. He wasn't perfect. 
But Lord, you filled him and you anointed him and you came upon him and you did things, Lord, upon his life and in and through his life, Lord, of which we have reaped incredible benefits. Lord, with, with all the battles and the struggles and so many times, as you tell one of the churches there in Revelation, that you have kept my word and my name. And Chuck so highly honored your word and he kept your name. And Lord, I pray that, that that is one of the great secrets of the man and he passed your name. He never defamed your name. He never took down your name. He never hurt your name. And he adhered to your word all the way through. And Lord, I pray that we would have that heart within us and that Lord, that you and your mercy and your love would pour out your spirit upon us. And Lord, that we would so deeply honor your name and that we would honor your word. We, we again, we thank you for the opportunity. We didn't think about this at all before we had our question and answer. It just kind of turned into a time where we realized how grateful we are for our heritage, for our founder, and realized perhaps he hasn't had that place. And Lord, we want to give him that place of honor and of respect and uh, for what he means to us and what he has been. And so, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we pray for Kay in, in her uh, condition, Lord, that you would strengthen her, that she has uh, good days and not so good days, and clear days and maybe not so clear. Bless her, Lord. She's been such a wonderful model for the women, and for the wives. Lord, what an incredible minister of the gospel she was to all the ladies the ladies' ministries that came up around the world through her and around the churches. And while some people wonder at the place of a woman within the church, as a Kay Smith had it in such tremendous proportion, it seems like the Calvary chapels, while people say, well, they don't know how to handle women. Well, you look at what has been done, Lord. We're so grateful what Kay produced. And we just honor her as well. So, Lord, we ask your blessing upon her. And, Lord, we just thank you now for this time and ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Lord, that this, through this, these remaining hours that we have as we would wait upon you, that your strength, that your love, that your spirit, Lord, that's what we need more and more and more of. Lord, may we get a, just a fresh anointing, a fresh empowering of your Holy Spirit, a said sense of the moving of your spirit within our hearts. Lord, we long to stand before people and to be able to say, that which I have received of the Lord have I delivered unto you that we have that assurance that the word of God is coming through us. So, Lord, we thank you for your call upon us. Thank you, Lord, that you have separated us under the work of the ministry. It is a high and holy and wonderful separation. And, Lord, may we continue to separate our hearts and our lives unto you for that work. And so, Lord, we do ask for a blessing on every single one that is here, whether this is their first conference or whether they've been to many conferences, Lord, it's such a refreshing one. For many of us, it's almost like we feel like we've been to the first conference since Chuck died. It's just such a unifying, wonderful spirit. Thank you for it. We praise you. We love you, Lord. We ask that you would just bless and pour out your spirit. Do a wonderful work in all of our hearts, all of our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.